Okay. So, I think we should start right on time this time. Uh, again, I'm Fabio Chiusi. Um, I'm a journalist of Les Pro L'Espresso and a fellow at the Nexus Center of Turin for Internet and Society. And with me, I have the pleasure to interview Owen Jones today, a writer at The Guardian, commentator and you know, political activist, can we say that? Yeah? And um, I have a lot, the, the topic is very broad, as you see, but I, I will try just to give uh, some introductory remarks to give you a flavor of what we're gonna be talking about, I think. And then we'll see where the conversation goes, opening up to the public, of course, uh, to the audience. So, uh, democracy is actually apparently in bad, bad shape, and we have a lot of data confirming what we all can see, basically. Uh, we have, here in Italy, we have every year demos, uh, having surveys about, you know, people uh, being in, um, for democracy or for authoritarianism, and actually what, what's mind-blowing is that one Italian uh, in three are indifferent between authoritarianism and democracy, or even prefer the former, and it's a trend that has been consolidating right now, and it's, gonna, it's been going on for, uh, for some years. YouGov's, uh, YouGov study uh, interviewed like 12,000 uh, um, uh, people across the continent in all of Europe, and nearly half of the adults in 12 European countries, they hold extremist views on immigration, on nationalism, and even opposition to human rights law. I, I was at a human rights conference in Brussels last week, and the first question that actually popped up is, does anybody care about the human rights framework anymore? Nobody actually does, apparently. And so we have this combination that you go of labels authoritarian populism. Also, last July, two researchers from the World Value Survey and an Harvard political scientist wrote, published a paper in which there are some kind of uh, very, very scary developments and findings. One of them were the, was that more than two-thirds of American millennials do not consider it essential to live in a country that is governed democratically. And about, about a quarter of them consider a democratic political system a bad or very bad way to run the country. Authoritarianism is on the rise. In 96, they write, only one in 16 Americans said it would be good if the military ruled the country. By 2014, it was one in six. So we have a kind of a disintegration of, of democracy, but also of its appeal to people, especially to young people. And that's kind of, of scary uh, development there. And its roots are not, uh, not new. You know, the, the roots trace back to the, the, at least the, the 80s, they say. So it's, it's like decades old now, and it's going worse and worse, apparently. But now, the, today, you know, we've seen, like, populists, as they say, it's an, a word that I don't particularly like, but anyways, you know, demagogues all over the place are winning elections. You know, we have, like, one uh, in the White House right now, for those who don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, uh, the, the threat appears to be bigger now than ever. So uh, Owen here wrote one, in one piece in, in The Guardian, I think it summed up pretty good, and he, said, he wrote, democracy is a bundle of rights and freedoms wrested from the powerful. But it is naive to regard this concession as permanent. Yet my impression is that, you know, this wrestling part, this struggle is not as strong as it should be, you know. So we've seen, it's true, we've seen, we've seen women marching in all of the states. You know, we've seen thousands of protesters in Russia last, some weeks ago. And yet it seems to me, you know, that this political struggle is not exactly at the level, uh, it's not the level that it's supposed to be to, to face such a threat. So, do we need, my first question is, do we need to escalate the political conflict, the level of conflict? Do we need to, b to bring more conflict to the political spectrum to actually try and reverse this trend? Uh, well, thank you. Firstly, it's an honor uh, to be here. Um, and blimey, that is a profound question. Um, well, the conflict has been, I mean, it's just a matter of, 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 of fact. We don't have to create a conflict. Mm. Uh, there's a very serious conflict of ideas uh, and movements uh, all over the Western world. Look, what, if we think back to the financial crisis of 2008, I think there was this naive view combined with schadenfreude on sections of the left. Look, everything we've said was argued has been proven correct. The market left untrammeled uh, has 
uh, and, and not regulated has plunged us into crisis. The greed of those at the top of society. Uh, free market ideology lies in ruins. A left will rise from the rubble of the financial sector. That hasn't quite happened as some probably hoped. And it was naive, I think, for a few reasons. Firstly, a crisis of capitalism, you would imagine, would automatically be uh, beneficial to the left. But history, I mean, that's, you know, it's counterintuitive to suggest otherwise, but that history does suggest otherwise. Mm. In the 1930s, economic crisis, who were the biggest uh, beneficiaries? Fascism. Uh, the 1970s, what we came to describe as neoliberalism was the beneficiary of the economic crisis of the 70s and the collapse of the post-war social democratic uh, consensus. And Milton Friedman, a right-wing economist, uh, he said that the way you get change is through crisis um, and then the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. But he said it depends on the ideas lying around. And in 2008, the left, as a coherent force with a mass base, was practically non-existent across the Western world. Um, and therefore, there was no, you know, it was naive in hindsight to think a movement which didn't exist would be the beneficiaries. The left, such as it was, was defined by what it was against. Stop the cuts, stop privatisation, stop various wars. Uh, but not necessarily having a compelling vision of its own of what society should look like. And so then what happened is cuts, austerity, swept the Western world, the left found itself in a purely defensive uh, posture. But now what's happened, and history rarely uh, repeats itself as the quote goes, but it often echoes, uh, we see the rise of right-wing populism with authoritarian uh, tendencies which is a risk to rights and freedoms that our ancestors had to fight for at great cost and at great sacrifice. And, you know, this conflict has been imposed uh, upon us. It's a failure of the left. It's a failure of the left at a time when people are angry and frustrated, when in my country, you know, we've suffered the longest fall in living standards since Napoleon was emperor of the French at the beginning of the 19th century, your country has suffered one of the longest falls in living standards of any EU country um, as well. Uh, massive rise in job insecurity, cuts to public services uh, that we all depend on, young people thrown out of work with all the devastating consequences that has. And because of our failure, the vacuum often has been filled by the scapegoating of immigrants and refugees for the behaviour of those people at the top of society. So yes, of course, we now have to get our act together. And above all else, it's about redirecting people's justifiable anger away from their neighbours, away from those at the bottom, immigrants, refugees, public sector workers, unemployed people, uh, to the people at the top of society. So of course that means protesting and organising, but we've got to be more creative. We've got to go to the communities that we fail to organise in, instead of just mobilising those who are already politicised. We've got to tap into that energy and go to the places where people are angry and frustrated and fearful of the future, but they haven't looked at us for answers because of our own failures. Um, and we equally have to work on a compelling vision. But of course we've got to organise. This is a time... Uh, you know, if you don't protest at a time like this, then when, is my question, I suppose. Oh, yeah. With someone like Donald Trump, this proto-fascist clown, as the most powerful man on earth. It, you know, future gen you know, people, without guilt-tripping people, then your, some of your children and grandchildren will ask, what did you do at a time like this? And I think all of us should have a very good answer. So we need to link up these struggles. The danger is we just have movements in each country in isolation. Mm -hmm. This is an international problem whether it be you know, uh, the, the nature of Brexit in Britain and, and how it's being used as a political and social counter-revolution, the rise of the National Front uh, in France, the Austrian far-right defeated in the presidential election but in a very good place for the next parliamentary election, whether it be the increasingly authoritarian regimes of Hungary and Poland, all of these struggles have to be linked together and we fail to do that. Uh, so that's, I think, our task today. Yes, we've got to build a movement from below. Yes, we've got to do far more in terms of organising and, and taking to the streets. 
but we do need to work on organising people in communities where people, most people aren't protesting, win them over, the dissatisfied, the disillusioned, the fearful, uh, and give them answers. Um, and we've got to have a compelling vision of society, which we, we haven't had yet. Yeah, my question would be that one, you know, exactly. What, how much, uh, how big a role should a new ideology for the left play? Do we need an ideological formulation one that is actually up to the tasks and the, and the threats and the, and the issues of this century. Well, yeah, I mean, when I went back, you know, I mentioned Milton Friedman before, and, you know, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, laissez-faire economics seemed to be entirely discredited. And a group of, uh, of those who believed in whatever they called it, 19th century liberalism, free market economics, they gathered in Montpellier in, in Switzerland, um, on the basis of, to quote a left-wing slogan, don't mourn, organise, which was, yes, they had suffered defeats because of the experience of the Great Depression, which seemed to discredit laissez-faire economics, and then the experience of World War II uh, and the rise of left-wing movements uh, in the West. In, in the West. Um, and, and what they did is they, they, uh, they laid the intellectual foundations for what would come, for when that crisis, as Milton Friedman predicted, did come in the 1970s. They set up think tanks all across Britain, Europe, the United States of America. You know, Milton Friedman, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, Karl Popper, all those people gathered there. And we failed, I think, to do that. I think it's still a case of being very defensive. It's basically we're often defined by defensive struggles to protect rights and freedoms that are under threat rather than having a compelling vision. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to have all of those answers. We do need to look at how the world is changing, um, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, I mean, just in terms of things on the horizon. Uh, we have ageing societies in places like Britain. It's older people who are turning away from the left. What are our answers there? The rise, uh, the change in the nature of the workforce, we've seen a shift from an industrial working class to a service sector working class, which is increasingly often precarious. People in self-employment who like the independence but not the insecurity, uh, who, uh, you know, who's, uh, who, who lack regular hours and paid maternity leave, paid sick leave, all of those rights that were previously taken for, as granted, for granted. Zero hour contracts, reluctant part-time work. But also, you know, the rise of technology, new forms of technology, are a threat but an opportunity. And, you know, I suppose in the past, because some people think it's alarmist, don't they, when we talk about the rise of new forms of technology and what that will do to the labour market, sure. that we've heard this all before. And in the past, it's true that new technology created more jobs than it destroyed. So the personal computer, when it arrived, made lots of jobs redundant, but it created apparently about 1,500 new types of employment. The danger today is technology could end up destroying more jobs than it creates. That retail, which has become one of the great sectors of employment in the Western world, that 70% could be mechanised within the coming years. Yeah. Where in, uh, in Britain, it's estimated that one report suggested 11 million jobs could disappear. Not just the unskilled and semi-skilled jobs of the past, but middle-class <coughs> professional jobs uh, would also vanish. So we've got to have an answer. People are debating things like basic income, for example, shortening the working uh, day. Uh, you know, Milton Keynes, uh, Milton Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, sorry, I'm thinking of a British city named after him. John Maynard Keynes, the economist, in 1930, predicted we'd now be working 15 hours a week. Hasn't quite panned out as hoped. <laughs> um, but, you know, we could be talking about, uh, yeah, of course, new forms of economy, because this could happen quite quickly. So we've got to adapt to how the conditions are. All too often, we're looking at the challenges of the 1970s when we had an industrial working class built around workplaces. We, we don't have communities based around call centres and supermarkets in the way we did around mines and steelworks. So the way we organise and the policies we argue for have to be different from in the past. Yeah, my point is what we organise for, you know. I'm taking your example with technology, for example. We, I don't quite, I'm not quite sure what the left thinks, for example, of this whole automation you know, mm -hmm. issue. Some, I, I'm, I'm, I think about two scholars, Nick Snitschak, Alex Williams, they published an essay on Verso. They say we should be automating, uh, we should embrace full automation, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and revive the old end of work uh, 
promise, you know, in which, you know, we, we just lay back and do creative things, you know, and let the robots do the job, you know, and produce everything. And on the other side, you have like uh, other leftist movements trying to regulate, trying hard to better regulate technology. On the, it is completely opposite, you know, and so, and so we should ban some form of automation. We should regulate, uh, have government intervention, for example, in algorithm, algorithm dictatorship. We, we, we've been talking here like a couple of hours ago. And I'm not quite sure, you know, how, how the, how, what, what, what the left should do under this, this respect. First of all, we should be studying these issues mm -hmm. better, maybe. But we should also try and propose some solutions. Otherwise, you know, populists get in. And, and just reverse the anger against the immigrants, against, you know, your fellow neighbor. Well, that book, Inventing the Future, um, which yeah. you, you've mentioned, yeah, exactly. um, which I thought was a, a very compelling piece of work, what because, you know, it argued that work was becoming increasingly precarious. That was just the direction of travel. After World War II, we had virtual full employment across the Western world, mm -hmm. and that age has come to a, an end, quite an abrupt end in, in, many, in many cases. And, and the danger is then you get a workforce, you get a, d a diminishing workforce, and those who are kind of superfluous to need mm -hmm. uh, are, are demonised, as they are in countries such as my own. Those who are, are not in work are are, are demonised for the way society is structured, the lack of decent, secure work, which mm -hmm. has disappeared in much of the Western world. I mean, I, I tend to favour what that book, Inventing the Future, argued for, because realistically are we going to start arguing for the banning of i don't know self-service machines in supermarkets it just doesn't seem realistic or or, mm. or feasible so you, you've got to talk about a new economic model it's the same i mean we look at uber that's a big challenge which the left you know in terms of to speak talk about and you know one suggestion is where we could have cooperatives set up co you know uh cooperative models of, yeah. of, of those forms, using technology, new forms of technology, obviously, but where instead of denying workers' basic rights, because in Britain, uh, Uber drivers were classed predictably as self-employed, so that, mean they, that meant they couldn't be paid a proper wage, they couldn't have paid sick leave, maternity leave, and then they had a big struggle in a court case which stripped them of self-employment right and gave them employee uh, protection rights instead. But it's a big struggle going on. But to make it viable, instead of having for-profit models like that, we could have cooperatives run, run by, uh, by drivers and others. So, you know, I think there are ways of adapting to this, the right of, techn of technology, the f new forms of technology, without removing rights and protections uh, from working people. And I do think it's healthy that we should be talking about reducing the amount that we work. We spend a third of our adult life, uh, on average, subservient uh, to, employ and to employers. It's, uh, I think, it obviously, working in that way reduces your uh, human freedom. And, you know, all over the Western world, I mean, in, in, uh, you know, in, in Britain and elsewhere, the statistics on unpaid overtime are very compelling. It's worth tens of billions of pounds to employers, people working for free. And again, with the rise of technology and email, we're always chained to our desk often oh, yeah. with smartphone technology. I think we should be looking at how both technology and increasing prosperity could reduce the amount that we work, that we have more time to spend with our families and loved ones and oh, yeah. pursuing the things that we want to pursue rather than uh, surrendering so much of our, of our life uh, to, uh, to, to work. And I think that technology offers that, that uh, you know, because we can still create the wealth. The robots will increasingly be producing uh, much, much of the wealth. Would not but consume the goods, though. No, that's true. <laughs> you know. But we'll we'll have more time to yeah. consume them. I mean, we should be arguing for yeah. that. I think, you know, we work. I think yes is very fulfilling for lots of people. Mm. But but I think we should be looking at a forms of society with the rise of mechanization uh, that can change our economic model and liberate people from 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 work. Do you degree. do you buy like Paul Mason's conclusions that this is already freeing us from capitalism and bringing us into post capitalism? And should the left aim? to a post-capitalist world. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of that thesis, I think there's lots of interesting facets uh, in terms of that, you know, the sharing economy you spoke yeah. about. I mean, again, the danger there is, you know, I mean, there's, I think, all sorts Destroying of... Destroying worker rights. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, the race to the bottom, uh, and in terms of what that's doing to the economy of, you know, and also who, not everyone can afford to, to do that, or they're not in desirable 
uh, locations in terms of Airbnb, you know, things like that, for example. But I yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, what we need to be doing is building societies that uh, put profit for a tiny elite, uh, you know, sorry, we need to build societies that put people's needs and aspirations ahead of profit for a, uh, for a tiny elite. Um, and that means, you know, I think, you know, take public ownership instead of the old form of public ownership, which was very top down and bureaucratic and undemocratic. Uh, so bureaucratic and democratic and so on we should be looking at forms of democratic social ownership I gave the example of Uber mm -hmm. but you know I mean in Britain our, I mean I don't know if anyone's been on the British Railways but it's a uh, they are a disaster they're a national embarrassment um, you know we have this fragmented inefficient privatised system uh, where uh, you know it, it's, it can be cheaper to get a same day flight to another European city than it is to travel in your own country uh, where you know it's you know you you know if you if you have the the honour of being on one of these trains where you're crushed against the window, having spent a huge amount of your pay packet uh, for the play, for the honour of doing so, you know. But instead, what we could do instead of the old form of nationalisation, we could bring the railways under democratic ownership of passengers and workers. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of how we democratise the economy and the workplace, I think, are great challenges rather than top down bureaucratic models that we used to have in the past and in Britain because we got under Thatcherism the mass privatization of publicly owned utilities but the truth was that was easy to do because people didn't feel they genuinely had a stake in those services they didn't they feel they were often responsive to their needs so there was often if not outright public support public acquiescence in the privatization of services and utilities that in theory belonged to the British people, but it didn't feel like that to people. But if you have democratic social ownership, then that would be very different. It's an alternative to both the market and to top-down statism. Do you see the internet right, as it is right now as an enabler of this kind of, of new forms of ownership, or, or is it a threat to, to it? Because, you know, it, it's another thing that struck me of, of the left in, in this contemporary debate, you know, that we, we both, idolize the internet and, and see and, and see it as an, a, a land of um, infinite opportunities you know and digital democracy and participation and we should be writing I, oh, even in the UK I think the LSE had a team trying to crowdsource a constitution you know and there is like quite quite good effort in there but also what we read every day is like you know these debates about fake news hate speech you know mm -hmm. uh, and po political polarization which is actually happening and we don't really know so how do you see it? is this are these factors enablers of of a new social movement from the left from uh, from the bottom i mean well in theory i mean i'd caveat it because i think i mean the the, the debate about fake news is interesting because yeah. Fake news is a threat, and it, you yeah. know, if we look at the rise of various right-wing populist movements, um, and other, another popular, I mean, the five, you could argue what the five-star movement is, but in terms of various populist movements, fake news has often been a driver. I mean, I think it, you know, when you get very polarized societies, that's mm -hmm. when fake news comes into its own because it reinforces certain prejudices and uh, beliefs that people have. But I, I suppose the reason I get frustrated is. It's not like fake news is a new thing. I mean, much of the mainstream no. press, the mainstream media... If I think in Britain, many of you will know about the Hillsborough disaster of 1989, when 96 Liverpool fans were crushed to death. And the main newspaper in the country, The Sun, peddled outright lies and falsifications to blame the fans uh, for, their own, uh, for their own tragedy, making up lies about fans urinating on the bodies of, of de dying fans, of sexually assaulting them and pickpocketing... All lies, all propagated by the main newspaper in Britain, or the page three of which had, uh, for, until very recently, uh, a woman topless every single day. Now, this peddling of, of, this, of these lies had terrible consequences for those families who had to fight for justice, and they had to fight for truth. Truth and justice, that was their struggle. Equally, during the miners' strike in Britain in 1984, um, there was the, a time when the police charged at the miners'. Liberty, the human rights organisation, called it a police riot. The BBC, the esteemed BBC, put the tape of that incident in a different order to make it look like the miners had charged at the police. And equally, when we look, you know, there's a journalist called Richard Pepia in Britain who resigned from the Star 
newspaper and newspaper after being told by his editors to make things up about Muslims in order to incite prejudice and cater to the worst hatred that people have. Equally, that could go on. People's attitudes about immigrants, refugees. Uh, people think there are far more immigrants than there are Muslims than there actually are. People in Britain, on average, think there are 20 times more teenage pregnancies than there are. I'm not just saying the media just brainwashes everyone. It's more complicated than that. But the media does have the mainstream old the old media has played a deeply pernicious role in spreading outright lies which have divided people, increased intolerance, and distorted people's view of the world. So let's not pretend this is a new thing. Oh, yeah. But equally, you know, I think clearly there are, there are possibilities for the left when it comes to the online world. My theory is with social media, often with Twitter, for example, is its users disproportionately tend to be younger and tend to be more affluent on average. Um, most people are getting on with their lives. They're not debating politics on Twitter. They've got families. They've got jobs. They'll come home at the end of the day, listen to a bit of the news. And, the, you know, in the last general election, I think a lot of people on the left were shocked. They were like, blimey. Everyone on Twitter hates the Conservatives. Um, you know, if Twitter was accurate, the Conservatives would, you know, Labour would have won a 150-seat majority. They didn't. And that's often because older people who the left needs to win over, because Labour only had, sorry, the Conservatives at the last election, they only had a lead amongst people over 44. The very sorts of people who are least likely to be using Twitter on a regular basis. But I think, you know, Facebook is arguably more demographically, it is more demographically representative. So I think there are potentials there. The potential is there. And I know some people talk about social media as people carve out their own bubble. Mm -hmm. But I, then again, was before the internet were people of different political oh, persuasions yeah. all chatting to each other? I'm not sure that's true. But nonetheless, there is obviously a danger if you get polarization across the Western world. And the way it's collided with social media can be very damaging. But it does have potential, clearly, to reach to, at a time when so much of the press is owned by a very small group of very rich media moguls, to bypass that, to give a platform to voices that are otherwise ignored. And it's becoming more important. But equally, I think the left sometimes falls back on, the, on, on social media as this, yeah. this is the way we'll bypass the mainstream media. And that's not going to happen because the vast majority of people still have to be reached in other ways, including, you know, organizing in the community. Yeah, which brings me to America. You know, America also had this problem. We, we read from a lot of liberal commentators that Trump won the election because of Facebook, you know, of course. And that's, of course, you know, exactly been debunked by what you say. But you also wrote that the American left would be reborn under President Trump. And one of the, of the, of the sentences I, that struck me is, you wrote, now it is the time for the left to craft a populist alternative. Why populist? What do you mean by populist? Well, well first of all, I think, um, I mean, the, Itali uh, sorry, the American left has arguably already been reborn. The, the American left is stronger now than it's been in, in four decades. And you've seen the biggest mobilization of people in the history uh, of the United States of America. Uh, you've seen, particularly amongst with the Bernie Sanders campaign, what it did, you know, he was a septuagenarian Jewish socialist uh, from Vermont, you know, the most unlikely of candidates who in a normal year would have got 1% or something uh, in the Democratic primaries uh, against what was then arguably the most powerful political machine in the United States, a country where scholars have always debated the lack, the absence of socialism the, in, in America. That was what made American exceptionalism, partly. And it was in 2016, you know, f 15 years or so after the end of the Cold War, when the most successful socialist in the United States had his campaign. Um, and, and what he did is he mobilized disproportionately younger people. So in some primaries, 80 to 85 percent of people under 30 uh, voted for Bernie Sanders, um, and that doesn't because if you look at all the polling when it comes to the economy, attitudes, the word socialism for that matter, uh, the welfare state, all the rest of it, there's a marked difference, a marked difference between so-called millennials, 35 and under, and older America. Completely different perspectives. Everything from trans rights mm -hmm. uh, to government intervention in the economy, and and Bernie Sanders, the whole point of that campaign given it didn't win, was to build, to help rebuild that mass movement. And that's what's happened. I went to the United States in January. I went to Washington, New York, North Carolina, uh, and Chicago. And all of these places have these growing grassroots movement, disproportionately 
winning over many younger uh, Americans whose lives are deeply insecure. Uh, and I think that's very positive. In terms of populism, clearly, you know, that has a lots of negative uh, connotations to people. I suppose, look, I look at the example of Podemos in Spain, a party which you know, was it emerged from the so-called indignados. Sure. Uh, well, it wouldn't have ex come into existence without the indignados of 2011, when millions of Spaniards took to the streets. We had the occupation of squares. Um, and, you know, you've got the anti-eviction movements, hundreds of thousands of Spanish uh, families dr thrown from their homes, uh, and this great anti-eviction movement. Um, and in a country where half of young people out of work, with life-scarring consequences... And, you know, that created the space to which Podemos emerged. Now, Podemos, you know, within two years of being founded, became the third party, one of the three major parties of Spain. They got millions of votes. And, and bear in mind, in Spain, there was already the united left. There was already a leftist movement, but it had a ceiling of support. You know, it could only get about 10% most. Podemos got more than double that ceiling, if you like. And I think what they did is they upset people traditionally on the left, because they said, you know, the frame they try to use, it's not about left or right, it's about the people and the elite, which is a populist kind of terminology. And the point Pablo Iglesias, the leader of Podemos, said, he said that most people in Spain don't cry at the same songs that I do. And what he meant was that he grew up in a leftist family, where leftist uh, ideas and symbols were very familiar to him, but that wasn't the experience of most people in Spain. You know, the colour of Podemos... Uh, is purple. You know, when they, the leaders come onto the stage, it rallies. They don't come onto the song of the of the tune of the Internationale. They come onto the tune from Ghostbusters instead. <laughs> and but what they've done is they've had a free, because most people don't think in terms of left or right. I do. I'm a sad, pathetic politico. Most people don't think in terms of left or right. They think in terms of issues to be addressed in a way that resonates with their experiences and told in a language they understand. This is a time when people are very angry with elites. The right-wing populists have very, caref very successfully uh, won over. You know, they've, they've marshaled that anger in, in a certain direction. That hasn't happened in Spain. They're notable as a country with, very, with no mass anti-immigration party of any major you know, European country. They don't have... Anti-immigration uh, rhetoric is not the central axis of Spanish politics or even close, like it is in so much of the rest of Europe. And that's because you've got a form of populism, which was, yes, obviously a leftist movement, but framed in a different way, in a far more clever way, that reached beyond the traditional confines of the left, which the united left, we'd already seen its limitations in Spain. So I think, yes, we need to say we're, we're building a kind of uh, a people, which you define who the people are, against an elite, uh, who are a threat to democracy uh, and, and a threat to the rights and freedoms that people have won. And that isn't something many people are comfortable with, but I think if we look at the state of the left in this country or my country or other countries, I think we need a bit of humility when we look at what's happened in Spain and what they've achieved. Not, they've not achieved what they'd like, they're not in government, as things stand, but in a very short space of time, they've had a great success, and I think we can learn from that approach. Yeah, it's time to read some Ernesto Laclau, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. And last question before opening up to the audience. I know you're writing a book about the politics of hope. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, well, sounds like satire, though, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, sounds. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is this? You know. What yeah. Kind of no, hope, no. What, what should we hope for? So I'm really selling the book, aren't I? Yeah. Um, so, no, no, obviously there's lots of hope. No, what, what I'm trying to do is, so this book is, is going to come out in Italy and Italian next year, but lots of other, uh, it's going to be published across Europe, uh, Asia and the United States. And I suppose it's going back to what I said uh, towards the beginning, because, you know, I've done two books, which are about Britain specifically, yeah. but they're analyses of, on the one hand, class and class inequality, on the other, the establishment about who has power. And partly for therapy, just because I want to cheer myself up, I want to... <laughs> want to write about, uh, instead of whinging about how negative and terrible and unjust things are, about what we actually do about it. So, on the one hand, the book is going to look at uh, things we can learn from already, which actually exist. I don't know, drugs decriminalisation in Portugal or the Finnish education system that doesn't have private schools and so on. The other is to look at ideas we haven't uh, implemented, so basic income and so on and how that could work. And the other is individuals and movements collectively organising 
against injustice. So I'm travelling everywhere at the moment. So I've been interviewing people here in Italy, but Turkey, Hungary, the United States, Austria, France, Scandinavia, uh, and so on. So the, the idea is to try and have an international book which looks at strategies that are working, yeah. you know, what, what actually is working, and, and to try and find a way at a time of right-wing populism, of insecurity, of fear for so many people, what kind of, what, how can we succeed as a left, as a movement, in, at a time where if we don't succeed, then I'm afraid the vacuum will be filled by right-wing populists. And I don't think the future does belong to the Donald Trumps or the Nigel Farages or the Marine Le Pens or the Orbans. It doesn't belong to those people, but it does need reflection on the part of the left. So it's partly me being self-critical mm. because I think there's a collective failure of the left oh, yeah. to have a clear, compelling alternative. So that's what I'm trying to do in this, in this book. Here's what an alternative could look like based on learning from the experiences of people struggling all over the world. So you did find commonalities among all these countries. Exactly. Yeah. That's, well, that's Even in Italy? For. Italy has something good to bring up to the, to the yeah. debate? Yeah. God, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's news, you know. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? But yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I, yes, I think yeah. there will be okay. things in Italy. Okay. So <laughs> there will. <laughs> After this shocking, you know, revelation, uh, I will be opening up to the audience <laughs> because I, <laughs> I'm quite skeptical. About down there, down there. Oh, there are lots of questions. Uh, if somebody can help with the mic, thanks. Oh, uh, there. Yeah. Thank you. Well, okay. Well, first of all, I mean, as an Italian, I wanted to thank you. I mean, it was the level of the, the conversation was really something. And uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, we're talking about automation and generally speaking, you know, skills bias, technological change. But isn't that kind of like already like conceding a point? I mean, there's, all, uh, there's a lot to say about, you know, a public policy during the last few years and right now too, monetary policy, fiscal policy. I mean, the governments, generally speaking, have really done a very poor job of, baffling job of, uh, you know, Uh, guaranteeing basically full employment, as Owen said. So shouldn't that be kind of like a priority and kind of like what makes the problem of automation a problem in itself? Yeah, I mean, that goal of full employment, I mean, I, yes, you know, obviously that should be our goal. I, was, I suppose questioning how much of the working day that should take up. Um, and I suppose, you know, can we build a society where people have not just good wages, but You know, good you know, lives. Huh? good lives. Good lives. Yeah, I mean that's the old phrase. You know the old phrase. Uh, you know, we don't just want uh, bread; we want roses. You know, the goal of the left is not to aim for subsistence. It's not to aim for just survival. You know, yes, obviously we are struggling for the abolition of poverty and insecurity, but we want much better than that. We want to build prosperous uh, societies where people can fulfil collectively and individually. Uh, you know, the full potential of society and the individual, uh, where people are free to, you know, uh, to, you know, with cultural pursuits and, and all the rest, all the, you know, we want a good society. We don't just want a society where people can, you know, have a roof over their head and can eat. That's not good enough. And I just think automation could provide that sort of uh, society. But obviously, we should be arguing for things like, you know, I'm not talking about surrender in that sense. We want things like, you know, there's a big an emerging debate in Britain about self-employment because it's predicted there'll be more self-employed people than public sector workers in the coming years about giving people, for example, paid sick leave and paid maternity leave and, uh, and uh, you know, things like not getting loans from banks if you're self-employed often, the terrible infrastructure that exists. If you're self-employed, you need to use your computer often wherever you are, but Wi-Fi in Britain is terrible. In Southeast Asia, they've invested in that whether it be, uh, you know, chasing invoices all the time. The point is, is, you know, it's not about surrendering. I mean, you know, increasingly self-employment is becoming, for example, a bigger part of the economy, and we want to win for self-employed workers rights that other workers once took for granted. It's the same with zero-hour contracts. I think there are, obviously should be a role for people who want flexible working, but not flexible working dictated by the employer, but flexible working that meets the needs uh, of the employee, particularly in workforces where women are still systematically discriminated against, uh, not least, you know, when it comes to 
raising families and then the consequences that has for women's jobs. So I think we should be fighting to, to extend rights that workers have throughout the economy, I just uh, the workforce, but I do think we should have a debate, given of the rise of automation, rather than having a situation where I think we will head towards, where work just becomes more precarious, where a growing section of the workforce basically are treated as superfluous to needs and then demonised and attacked for it, that we build a different sort of economy uh, which can shorten the amount of work that people you know, do on a daily basis. I, it's a debate that we should be having, in my opinion, but it's still fighting for rights that workers have and extending them. Questions? Over there. Yep. Hello, a short question that kind of connects to this. So you've also been talking... Oh, sorry. <coughs> Um, you were also talking about these social cooperatives. Sounds like a very good idea to me. Can you say anything about how this is in the political discourse currently in the UK? Are there any politicians who are taking these ideas up? Can you see uh, future developments in this area? Yeah, very good point. Well, despite the problems afflicting the Labour leadership, which is probably another conversation, unless someone asks about it. Uh, but they have been talking about this. The Shadow Chancellor, the Shadow Finance uh, Minister, John McDonnell, did a speech where he looked at, for example, cooperatives when it came to Uber uh, and, and other such services. I mean, other examples are things like delivery. You know, Deliveroo, which is, has horrendous terms and conditions for workers. Their class is self-employed, so they don't get a proper wage, proper rights. So, yes, Labour has made a pitch about this, I, I, I think you'd probably, you know, have to... I don't think people are aware of it. It's not in the public consciousness. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for that. But Labour are making that... have started to make the case for that. Because I think for a while with Uber, the danger with the left is that we ended up in a... in a, in a kind of not very... an untenable situation where we just railed against it on the basis of what it was doing to workers' rights. But it, it's kind of trying to stop the inevitable, it was barking at thunder, and instead of saying, well, actually, what could a left response be that could both, both fuse people's desire to have, use their technology to have easily, you know, kind of accessible taxis wherever they are, where they can, you know, that's a very good thing, but in a way that it's not run for profit, but it meets the needs of the drivers. So, yes, I think that debate is starting, but I'd be lying if I said that you know, probably more than 0.1% of Britain knew that debate had happened, if that. But it is, it is emerging as a debate, yeah. Um, down there, back there. Yep. Um, thank you. My question, I think, will be quite short. Um, you, you mentioned them in passing, but I was wondering if you could say, from a left-wing perspective, what do you make of the five-star in Italy? Um, and since you've been traveling in Italy, whether you've met any of them and what you think of them. Thanks. Uh, great question. Five Star Movement. Mm, interesting. They're quite unique as a populist formation in Europe because you can't easily categorize them as left wing or right wing populists. Um, arguably, some of their elements, and I haven't met them yet, I am intending to, by the way, to ask to talk to an interview Five Star Movement people. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting because a lot of their demands, you know, that they've argued for traditionally come from the left, like public water, uh, for example, which is obviously one of the five demands. Um, and I think what happened, and people in this room, this is what I've just, in the last few days, talking to people, kind of, and researching and the rest, uh, because I was always curious about the Five Star Movement, they've clearly filled a space which a, a savvy, strategically able left could have filled, but what you've seen with the Five Star Movement, I think, is some argued originally that at least what was beneficial is they weren't indulging originally in anti-immigration rhetoric at the core of what they argued for, unlike other populist formations, but that's clearly changed. And you have, obviously, growing, a growing shift towards the, those sorts of arguments. But what, what's been put to me about the Five Star Movement, I'd be interested to see if people agree with this, is that they kind of like they represent this weird stasis in that they're a block on the emergence of a left wing, a genuinely left wing populist movement, but they're also a block on the emergence of a national front style movement as well. They're kind of like they're a kind of they're a populism of the centre of a certain type, 
which is uh, difficult to describe and includes elements of both. And even if you look at their politicians, I mean, uh, their MEPs obviously at the moment sit with UKIP and Nigel Farage at the European Parliament, but some of their MEPs go in, they go to, uh, they attend meetings of the radical left grouping of the European Parliament. So they're very com confused and complex movement. I would say their internal contradictions are impossible to keep them together in the long term. I mean, they're kept together in a very undemocratic way. My understanding is, you know, you'll get five-star primary uh, movement primaries, and then Beppe Grillo will go, nope, that person's not good enough. You're going to have to rerun it over again. So the idea of participation, grassroots participation, which was part of their initial appeal, I don't think is real. I think they're actually a very top-down hierarchical formation. But as I've said, it'll be interesting to see what happens, because unless people believe otherwise... As a coalition, they're full of so many contradictions, I can't see how they'll last. And if they do fragment, it will be interesting to see if you get a national populist movement, not just like the League of Nord, uh, you know, the Northern League, but a national kind of uh, populist right-wing movement and maybe something like Podemos. But having met people on the left in Italy over the last few days, I can't see a, something like Podemos getting off the ground as things stand. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Five Star in that sense. Probably the only real past ideological movement we can mm. see, you know. I don't, I'm not particularly fond of past ideology, but this, no. I think it applies. Um, uh, here, in the front, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. I've got a question about the UK. Um, I wondered how important you think it is for the left to rally around the Labour leadership, whatever its shortcomings, um, compared to maybe focusing on other struggles to achieve the kinds of changes you've been talking about, especially with Brexit being underway. Thanks. Hmm. Um, Labour leadership. I think... So, Jamie, I've known Jamie Corbyn for many, uh, you know, many years. I used, to, I used to, I originally worked for John McDonnell, who I mentioned before, his key ally, uh, over a decade ago. And what happened after the last general election is the, which was, you know, I, I think the fear that existed on the left of the Labour Party was we faced extinction. After that defeat, there was a sense the Labour Party would dramatically shift off to the right. And there was a sense that, you know, this was a time of economic crisis. If we couldn't succeed now, then what was the point? And there was a discussion which was uh, that who should stand and a group of the small faction of the left MPs. And basically it was a case of, all right, Jeremy, it's your turn this time. Um, and, but there was a struggle to get on the ballot paper because you need to get a percentage of MPs to get there. And ironically, what happened is this. Labour originally had a way of electing its leader where a third of the votes went to MPs, a third went to trade unions, and a third went to party members. That was abolished under pressure from the right wing of the Labour Party because they wanted to dilute the influence of trade unions. Ironically, that system is what allowed Jamie Corbyn to win because their view was our members are too left wing, will copy countries like Italy, where if you get that anyone is a member of the public to just pay a tiny amount of money, three pounds, Pay uh, then will we'll shift towards the so-called, what they regard as the centre ground. That didn't happen. Jeremy Corbyn got on. He didn't expect to win. When he got on the ballot paper, he said, now make sure I don't win. And, uh, you know, he said to me early on, Owen, if I get 20 to 25%, that'll be a success. And I was like, yeah, Jeremy, I thought it was delusional. I thought he'd get 15. You know, the aim was come third. Beat the Blairite candidate. So when he became a leader... This is somebody who wasn't prepared to be leader. You know, there was no ambition. He's not an ambitious man. He'd fought for lots of causes, often very unpopular at, at the time. Uh, and, uh, and he didn't, you know, normally if you're leader, you have a big professional team already around you. You're prepared. You experience of the media. You have a network of sympathetic journalists. None of that happened. Uh, none of that was relevant. So when he became leader, inevitably he faced the firestorm, which would always have happened with any left-wing leader, but I don't think there was a clear strategy there and there was a lack of any clear vision. So Labour was, def you know, if you don't define yourself, you'll always be defined by your opponents. And the right are very good at this. They have clear messages and a clear vision, which they repeat ad infinitum. They define themselves and their opponents. It helps if you have most of the press on your side. Yes, of course it does. But it is my view now that Labour, as things stand, 
are heading for a very, very, very bad election defeat indeed. The worst since 1918 in terms of percentage, the worst in seats since the 1930s. It's not just because of mistakes made by the leadership. Brexit is a big, big problem for the Labour Party because some Labour voters, particularly younger voters, particularly people in cities, they hate Brexit. It's a, the worst thing that's ever happened. It's a nightmare to them. But for other Labour voters, and these tend to be older, working-class voters in the north, they think they've got their country back. They're jubilant about it. How do you keep that coalition together? That is very, very hard, and any leader would struggle. My fear at the moment, and I've been very open about this, is because that Labour is heading for such a bad defeat, and there hasn't been a snap general election, there could be one, in which case Theresa May will win a huge victory, Jamie Corbyn will then resign, and the, Labour, the left will be blamed for that defeat, and the Labour Party will shift off to the right. And I don't want that to happen. I think the left will be, at, it will be a terrible, terrible defeat for the left, which will be very, very difficult to recover from, not because the policies are unpopular, investment in the economy, not cuts, public ownership, tax justice, workers' rights, polls show these are all popular things. But unfortunately, you know, the polling now shows in Britain he's less popular than Donald Trump. And in London, uh, his approval rating is minus 44%. And that's in London, which is you know, where his politics really should resonate the most. And I think, for me, I don't see how that is going to be reversed. There's no historical precedent for such ratings to be reversed. I haven't seen the strategy there to reverse it. So my own view is, maybe it would be better to do a deal whereby, or have an approach where somebody else from the left can take over, who can start from the beginning, learn from the mistakes, have a clear vision from the outset, uh, because otherwise, and that's my own view. Now, people, some on the left, don't like that view, but it is an honest view, because I, I, I do not want Labour to suffer a very bad defeat for which the left is blamed, um, and I think we can avoid that. We can have a left-wing government in Britain. It's not easy, but I can't see at the moment how that will be possible as things stand. I can't. Question? Um, do you see any role by television for this populist, for this rise of on right, television, of television and television news, um, for the rise of right populists? Oh, I see. Because apparently, I mean, many public televisions used to be very close to the left, and now it's changing, or it's already changed, and much of the political influence actually comes from. 24-hour news channels or basically television as a format. Do you think there is any help for a, for a television that would help the, the, the left populist? Populism, at least. Well, I mean, in America, they don't have... Uh, in Britain, supposedly, we have broadcasting rules which uh, enforce so-called impartiality. Now, I don't think the media is impartial. I'm not talking about the press. I'm talking about TV news. But nonetheless, in, in America... Um, you don't have those rules. And in practice, what that means is there aren't many rich people who are sympathetic to the left. So TV stations end up like Fox News that are privately owned tend to be very supportive, obviously, of the right. So that gives them an inbuilt advantage. The right is always going to be favoured by media moguls. Media moguls overwhelmingly tend to the right. That's no surprise. They're very rich people. They want lower taxes on themselves. Uh, they have an employer-employee relationship, so they obviously are often opposed to trade unions and workers' rights. Uh, you know, they support deregulation, partly for their own business reasons. So the danger is, obviously, with TV, as things stand, with the rules that America has, that will always favour the right, and it did with Donald Trump. He's obviously a reality TV star. That helps. But even, you know, I think what happened you know, during that last election, and, I, you know, I do think we partly have to look at the failures of the democratic, the terrible failures. A lot of people, I think it's very comforting to go, ah, oh, it's all Russia, rather than look at, you know, the, the terrible failings of the Democratic Party establishment. But nonetheless, obviously, it's true that, you know, TV throughout treated uh, Donald Trump uh, as this fascinating phenomenon and, 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 and he got the, the coverage he received including by those opposed to him greatly helped him there's no question of that I don't know but as I've said I don't see how the left can unless you get unions which put all this money into setting up their own TV channels 
it, it doesn't seem that realistic because we don't have the money to do that. That said, I mean, in, uh, in, in Spain, the rise of Podemos partly, it was, for example, uh, La Turca, this YouTube channel that was uh, Pablo Iglesias that helped his prominence. Um, and, yeah, so you can see the potential there in theory. But I, I, guess, I guess I just can't see how TV stations owned by media moguls will help, ever help the left unless we find a model where we can set up our own TV stations that aren't rubbish uh, and poorly resourced and no one will watch. Uh, and that, so that's a big challenge. I think we have less than five minutes, so one last question, or, or two. Okay, two, one, one here. My question's really quick. I just wanted to ask you, what's our position, our role as journalists towards approaching those politics of hope you were speaking of? So, sorry, it's here. Okay. Our position as journalists... Okay, I'm yeah. getting up. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to see you. I was asking, um, what's our position, our role as journalists towards those approaching those um, politics of hope, as your book is called? Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a journalism conference, and uh, half of the panels are sponsored by Google and Facebook, the new data oligarchs. And uh, so um, there, there is a palpable sense that um, those companies are swallowing journalism as a whole. And um, so the, the question would be, uh, how do you think uh, you know, the left should deal with uh, the, the rising influence of tech industry in journalism? Yeah, and as I speak on this Facebook, Google platform, they are obviously a big problem uh, with modern journalism. Well, they are. I mean, it's just pointless pretending otherwise. They're, you know, lots of journalism is being bankrupted, uh, and they're not regulating the news properly, so you end up with the dissemination of outright lies. I mean, The Guardian, for example, has a system whereby, you know, uh, if things have got wrong, they're corrected at the bottom uh, very I immediately. And, you know, Facebook and Google, which are devouring all the advertising revenue as other news sources increasingly go into terrible financial decline with consequences for journalism, um, it is a problem. But in terms of the position of journalists, uh, our position as journalists, well, it depends you know, depends on the journalist, but I just speak as I see it. You know, I didn't want to be a writer, unfortunate. Uh, I don't even enjoy writing, which is even more unfortunate. But I saw it as a, as a, I saw it as a means to an end uh, to give a platform to causes, people, and ideas that are otherwise ignored. And for me, what much of the press does is it punches down rather than punches up. So my view is that the role of the sort of journalist or whatever writer that I see myself as is one of challenging injustice scrutinizing and challenging the powerful and giving a platform to movements and causes uh, and people who are organizing against those injustices I, as a socialist i believe that all change is collective i don't think indiv i think individuals have a limited role they do have a role but it's limited but nonetheless journalists can play a role if you see in britain the struggle for tax justice uh, uk uncut occupied shops and businesses whose owners weren't paying their taxes. And they forced that issue of tax avoidance on the agenda. And you needed progressive journalists to give a platform to respond to, to, the, to what they did and, 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 and work in tandem with them to drive the issue of tax justice on the agenda. So I see the struggle for progressive change as a multi-pronged offensive. You need people, I don't know, using social media. You need people who are organising in the streets and protesting. You need people who do peaceful civil disobedience. You need people who go on strike. You need people who organise in their workplace. You need people who organise in their community. You need people who are elected as politicians. And you need journalists who are sympathetic to progressive change. And this should all come together as a collective uh, movement. So for me, you know, I, what I always encourage, you know, what I think whenever I speak to younger aspiring journalists... You know, my view is I say to them, you know, you're the, you should be there to challenge the powerful. You're not there to spread myths uh, about immigrants and refugees and stigmatise people who are, uh, you know, escaping violence or people who are without work or public sector workers having their pensions taken away. You should be there to scrutinise the vested interests who run our society, who rule all of us, including much of the press, and to challenge them. And that means challenging myths that are difficult to challenge at a time when it is very, very popular to blame foreigners for many of the problems caused by people at the top. And it's very hard. It feels like you're swimming against a very strong tide if you're challenging the status quo. But we need journalists who do all of those things.
You know, that's why I think of people like, I mentioned Richard Pepiat, who resigned uh, from his newspaper after being told to make up lies about Muslims, whether it be a conservative journalist, a maverick conservative journalist, Peter Oborn, who resigned from the Daily Telegraph because the Daily Telegraph refused to cover a scandal involving the HSBC bank because they were receiving advertising revenue from HSBC. So he resigned because he was a man of principle and honour and decency. We need journalists who are prepared to confront the powerful, prepared to take on myths, and prepare, prepared to give a platform to injustices that are ignored and people who suffer the consequences of them. And there's a lack of those journalists because of the way the media works. It's often, a cl it's often you know, overwhelmingly in Britain and elsewhere, people who often, it's not just ownership, the people who write the news are often from very similar privileged backgrounds where there's a lack of understanding or sympathy towards those who suffer the consequences of very, very unjust societies that don't meet the needs and aspirations of millions, whilst in places like Britain, the wealth of the richest people double as hundreds of thousands of people are driven to charities in order to eat. Mm -hmm. So we need those journalists. They are part of a collective movement. They're not the most important part, but they're an imp they are an important part. But the only way we're going to get collective change is all of these people on the streets, journalists, people in the workplace, sympathetic politicians coming together to organise against injustice. And just finally on that, there's lots of examples. All the rights and freedoms we have were not given to us by the generosity of the powerful. The powerful didn't wake up one day and think, I'm feeling generous, I'm going to give women the vote for a laugh. People had to organise at great cost and great sacrifice. And that included courageous people on the streets, but it also included courageous journalists who were prepared to suffer ridicule and humiliation and to be ignored and all the rest because they had the audacity to stand with people who are struggling for their rights. And that's a proud history of journalism that people should be very proud of and that's a tradition we should continue today. Thanks. And on a final note, On a final note, I would just like to add, you know, for the last question, that no critique has been spared to Facebook or Google here Good. at the festival. And, and I personally did a lot of them, you know, so <laughs> I'm quite proud of it. So thanks Should we do a protest? Let's go and protest against them now. <laughs> Definitely. Occupy. <laughs> Occupy the building. Thanks a lot for being here. Bye. Cheers. And well done. Well done. <laughs> well done. So, I think we should start right on time this time. Uh, again, I'm Fabio Chiusi. Um, I'm a journalist of Les Pro L'Espresso and a fellow at the Nexus Center of Turin for Internet and Society. And with me, I have the pleasure to interview Owen Jones today, a writer at The Guardian, commentator, and you know, political activist, can we say that? Yeah? And, um, I have a lot, the, the topic is very broad, as you see, but I, I will try just to give uh, some introductory remarks to give you a flavor of what we're going to be talking about, I think, and then we'll see where the conversation goes, opening up to the public, of course, uh, to the audience. So, uh, democracy is actually apparently in bad, bad shape, and we have a lot of data confirming what we all can see, basically. Uh, we have, here in Italy, we have every year demos uh, have been surveys about you know people uh, being in, um, for democracy or for authoritarianism, and actually what what's mind blowing is that one Italian uh, in three are indifferent between authoritarianism and democracy, or even prefer the former. And it's a trend that has been consolidating right now. And it's going it's been going on for uh, for some years. YouGov's uh, YouGov study uh, interviewed like 2,000 uh, 200. Um, 12,000 uh, people across the continent in all of Europe, and nearly half of the adults in 12 European countries, they hold extremist views. 
on immigration, on nationalism, and even opposition to human rights law. I, I was at the human rights conference in Brussels last week, and the first question that actually popped up is, does anybody care about the human rights framework anymore? Nobody actually does, apparently. And so we have this combination that you go of labels authoritarian populism. Also last July, two researchers from the World Value Survey and an Harvard political scientist wrote, published a paper. Uh, posture. But now what's happened, and history rarely uh, repeats itself as the quote goes, but it often echoes, uh, we see the rise of right-wing populism with authoritarian uh, tendencies which is a risk to rights and freedoms that our ancestors had to fight for at great cost and at great sacrifice. And, you know, this conflict has been imposed uh, upon us. It's a failure of the left. It's a failure of the left at a time when people are angry and frustrated, when in my country, you know, we've suffered the longest fall in living standards since Napoleon was emperor of the French at the beginning of the 19th century, your country has suffered one of the longest falls in living standards of any EU country um, as well. Uh, massive rise in job insecurity, cuts to public services uh, that we all depend on, young people thrown out of work with all the devastating consequences that has. And because of our failure, the vacuum often has been filled by the scapegoating of immigrants and refugees for the behaviour of those people at the top of society. So yes, of course, we now have to get our act together. And above all else, it's about redirecting people's justifiable anger away from their neighbours, away from those at the bottom, immigrants, refugees, public sector workers, unemployed people, uh, to the people at the top of society. So of course that means protesting and organising, but we've got to be more creative. We've got to go to the communities that we fail to organise in, instead of just mobilising those who are already politicised. We've got to tap into that energy and go to the places where people are angry and frustrated and fearful of the future, but they haven't looked at us for answers because of our own failures. Um, and we equally have to work on a compelling vision. But of course we've got to organise. This is a time... Uh, you know, if you don't protest at a time like this, then when, is my question, I suppose. Oh, yeah. With someone like Donald Trump, this proto-fascist clown, as the most powerful man on earth. It, you know, future gener... You know, people, without guilt-tripping people, then your, some of your children and grandchildren will ask, what did you do at a time like this? And I think all of us should have a very good answer. So we need to link up these struggles. The danger is we just have movements in each country in isolation. This in which there are some kind of... Uh, very, very scary developments and findings. One of them were the, was that more than two-thirds of American millennials do not consider it essential to live in a country that is governed democratically. And about, about a quarter of them consider a democratic political system a bad or very bad way to run the country. Authoritarianism is on the rise. In 96, they write, only one in 16 Americans said it would be good if the military ruled the country by 2014, it was one in six. So we have a kind of a disintegration of, of democracy, but also of its appeal to people, especially to young people. And that's kind of, of scary uh, development there. And its roots are not, uh, not new. You know, the, the roots trace back to the, the, at least the, the 80s, they say. So it's, um, it's like decades old now, and it's going worse and worse, apparently. But now, today, you know, we've seen, like, populists, as they say, it's a word that I don't particularly like, but anyways, you know, demagogues all over the place are winning elections, you know, we have, like, one uh, in the White House right now, for those who don't know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, uh, the, the threat appears to be bigger now than ever, so uh, Owen here wrote one, in one piece in, in The Guardian, I think it summed up pretty good, and he, said, he wrote, democracy is a bundle of rights and freedoms wrested from the powerful. But it is naive to regard this concession as permanent. Yet my impression is that, you know, this wrestling part, this struggle, is not as strong as it should be, you know. So we've seen, it's true, we've seen, we've seen women marching in all of the states. You know, we've seen thousands of protesters in Russia last, some weeks ago. And yet it seems to me, you know, that this political struggle is not exactly at the level, uh, it's not the level that it's supposed to be to, to face such a threat. So, 
Do we need, my first question is, do we need to escalate the political conflict, the level of conflict? Do we need to, to bring more conflict to the political spectrum to actually try and reverse this trend? Uh, well, thank you. Firstly, it's an honour uh, to be here. Um, and blimey, that is a profound question. Um, well, the conflict has been, I mean, it's just a matter of, 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 of facts. We don't have to create a conflict. Mm. Uh, there's a very serious conflict of ideas uh, and movements uh, all over the Western world. Look, what, if we think back to the financial crisis of 2008, I think there was this naive view combined with schadenfreude on sections of the left. Look, everything we've said, was argued, has been proven correct. The market left untrammeled, uh, has, uh, and, and not regulated, has plunged us into crisis. The greed of those at the top of society uh, free market ideology lies in ruins. A left will rise from the rubble of the financial sector. That hasn't quite happened as some probably hoped. And it was naive, I think, for a few reasons. Firstly, a crisis of capitalism, you would imagine, would automatically be uh, beneficial to the left. But history... I mean, that's, you know, it's counterintuitive to suggest otherwise, but that history does suggest otherwise. In the 1930s, economic crisis, who were the biggest uh, beneficiaries? Fascism. Uh, the 1970s, what we came to describe as neoliberalism was the beneficiary of the economic crisis of the 70s and the collapse of the post-war social democratic uh, consensus. And Milton Friedman, a right-wing economist... Um, he said that the way you get change is through crisis, um, and then the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. But he said it depends on the ideas lying around. And in 2008, the left, as a coherent force with a mass base, was practically non-existent across the Western world. Um, and therefore, there was no... You know, it was naive in hindsight to think a movement which didn't exist would be the beneficiaries. The left such as it was, was defined by what it was against. Stop the cuts, stop privatisation, stop various wars, uh, but not necessarily having a compelling vision of its own of what society should look like. And so then what happened is cuts, austerity, swept the Western world, the left found itself in a purely defensive... Uh, this is an international problem, whether it be you know, uh, the, the nature of Brexit in Britain and, and how it's been used as a political and social counter-revolution, the rise of the National Front uh, in France, the Austrian far-right defeated in the presidential election but in a very good place for the next parliamentary election, whether it be the increasingly authoritarian regimes of Hungary and Poland, all of these struggles have to be linked together and we fail to do that. Uh, so that's, I think, our task today. Yes, we've got to build a movement from below. Yes, we've got to do far more in terms of organising and, and taking to the streets. But we do need to work on organising people in communities where people, most people aren't protesting, win them over, the dissatisfied, the disillusioned, the fearful, uh, and give them answers. Um, and we've got to have a compelling vision of society, which we, we haven't had yet. Yeah, my question would be that one, you know, exactly. What, how much... Uh, how big a role should a new ideology for the left play? Do we need an ideological formulation, one that is actually up to the tasks and the, and the threats and the, and the issues of this century? Well, yeah, I mean, when I went back, you know, I mentioned Milton Friedman before, and, you know, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, laissez-faire economics seemed to be entirely discredited. And a group of... Uh, of those who believed in whatever they called it, 19th century liberalism, free market economics, they gathered in Montpellier in, in Switzerland um, on the basis of, to quote a left-wing slogan, don't mourn, organise, which was, yes, they had suffered defeats because of the experience of the Great Depression, which seemed to discredit laissez-faire economics, and then the experience of World War II uh, and the rise of left-wing movements uh, in the West, in, in the West. Um, and, and what they did is they, they, uh, they laid the intellectual foundations for what would come, for when that crisis, as Milton Friedman predicted, did come in the 1970s. They set up think tanks all across Britain, Europe, the United States of America. You know, Milton Friedman, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, 
uh, Karl Popper, all those people gathered there. And we failed, I think, to do that. I think it's still a case of being very